All right. So I'm Brian Cardell uh, at Egalia, and I'm here with my coworker. Yeah, hi. This is Nicolas Zimmermann from Egalia. And uh, we're going to talk about a whole bunch of fun stuff today. Uh, SVG and WebKit and embedded browsers and standards. And uh, it's because we plug into a lot of that here at Egalia. But I'd like to kind of start in a little bit of a funny place because um, the first time I met you, I learned this uh, really interesting origin story, which actually ties into it really well and I think is also just super compelling and interesting. So we try not to spend too much time on it, but let's go way back and talk about origins. Give us the how did you get into programming, like the short introduction. Well, I got into programming quite early, I think at the age of 10. So uh, my mother owned a, um, a store and um, from the previous owner, she got a, um, a computer in, in this store, but not a not really a computer as you think of it in, in today's terms, but it was basically a machine that you would plug into a TV. It was a runtime basic interpreter. So when you started up the thing, it, it just t told you 100 ready. Yeah, but it had a manual written in, in German and um, I had a lot of free time. I started to read the manual and try out things and that's how I got into programming. Um, hard drives uh, at, at this time weren't uh, really a thing, not at all. So uh, if you wanted to store your, your stuff, you would need to plug it in a cassette recorder to save your work. So it was really cumbersome. I also started with a, a TI-994A that was uh, a computer that was just like that. You plug it into your TV, kind of a um, it wasn't even a coax cable, if you can believe it. Like at the time, you would kind of screw into your antenna a coax adapter. Um, and it also had a cassette recorder and everything. And that's also how I started learning basic. But there's a really interesting spin to this. People who don't know us won't catch this, but we're actually quite different ages. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so uh, for me, that was like 1981, uh, roughly, something about that. Uh, but I think you weren't even born in 1981. Yet. That's correct. <laughs> uh, so when you started, there were considerably more advanced machines. There were like Windows and Macs and PCs, and even the web already existed, I think, when you were 10, right? Right. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really happy that I had this kind of, uh, let's say, old school education uh, by, um, by accident. It really uh, helps to, to, to learn things from really the basic concepts on, onwards. Let's say. So, but then, then you shifted and you, like, you started using those more modern computers. Like, what, what happened? Right. Uh, so at, at some point, my father discovered that there was something called QBasic available on his uh, uh, machine. So I think back then he had a DOS machine with, with Windows free something. I discovered this and it was, all, it was really uh, perfect since uh, I could finally um, save my work and, and work on multiple projects and, and toy around. And um, my father back then was a tax accountant. And I managed to uh, crash his machine two times, basically erasing everything. So he had to <laughs> redo a lot of work for his clients, uh, which took him months, I think, um, since he uh, wasn't used to backups. <laughs> and um, this finally uh, 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 gave me my own machine. And from, from then on, I really got into this uh, computing and uh, Linux free software business. Linux uh, is really interesting. Like, how did you, so you're very young. I mean, how, how did you learn about Linux? Because I, I think, I don't know how many people today would realize this, but like at the time, Linux was considerably more obscure than it is today. Yes, so um, in, in the first year, I think I, I um, programmed exclusively on, on Windows, uh, like using Visual Basic and stuff like this. Um, but since my mother owned a, a store where, where there were lots of computer magazines and everything, I had uh, access, free access to all of these. And uh, I basically read something like 10 magazines each week. And uh, there was a lot of uh, topic regarding Linux at this time. So there were magazines covering, uh, featuring uh, Linux. And uh, this really uh, hooked me since... Um, it was an opportunity to learn about the details or inner workings of an operating system by simply looking at the source code. 
so like I said, the web already existed at this point, but how we do and think about all of this has dramatically evolved. Right. When Tim conceived of the web, Windows and Mac were already like advanced and there were hypermedia systems and almost browsers kind of existed already in a lot of ways. But all of this was very proprietary shrink wrapped thing. And um, there even, I have this great image of um, Tim Berners-Lee like literally trying to give away the idea of a browser to Ian Ritchie from Owl Software, which so the web was almost born as a like shrink wrap project because he had to do it himself and the web was very fringe and Linux was at the time very fringe. And there's this new idea of, well, relatively new idea of like free software. It's not really the same as open source. We'll come back to that. That's kind of the time frame we're talking about here where you come into this and you're at the ripe old age of what, 13? <laughs> That's correct. Yes. So, so when I started using Linux, I, I cannot even remember which distribution it was. Um, it came pre-installed with uh, the KDE, the K desktop environment. Um, so I found it really a, an interesting and cool project and um, I immediately wanted to contribute. So I first started by um, helping translating stuff from English to German and um, I started to hang around on IRC and talk to other people in this community. And um, due to my background, like I was quite confident with uh, basic programming, I wanted to learn C and C++ to help contribute KDE. So that's what I did on, uh, and well, it was quite successful in the end with the help of many people from the community. I just love this story because it's like such a cool thing about like communities and history and everything. So like you're in your early teens or something and uh, you get a homework assignment, right? And you think, I would really like to include some diagrams in this homework assignment. Right. That's, um, that's correct. I, I was given a homework assignment. I wanted to um, put in some flow charts. And um, I, of course, was a Linux user at, at this time. And I wanted to use some, some existing programs. Um, and one of it was Kaivio which was a program included in the K-Office suite for, for KDE. Um, and it was a really a nice piece of software. But the problem is you would need some uh, stencils to draw these diagrams. So I was looking, where can I get some free stencils? And the answer was, there are no for K-Office for Kaivio, but there are some in, a, in an alternative GNOME project called DIA. They uh, had a huge set of stencils and they were all written in SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics, which was new to me at this time. So that's how I initially learned about Scalable Vector Graphics. In 1999, SVG was like really new. That, that's correct. Yeah. In order to fulfill my homework assignment, um, I then thought, okay, I need to write an import filter for SVG so that Kaivio can, uh, uh, can pass and render these SVGs and I can finally finish my homework. So this was the basic idea. Add a simple subset of SVG to Kaivio to, to be able to render these stencils. That was the beginning. So here's my question. Did you ship the homework? Uh, I think I did. Yes. <laughs> okay. With like with the diagrams. Right. I mean, yeah. honestly, I only put in as much as needed to render the first basic stencil so I could finish it, um, finish the homework. <laughs> so a few months go by and you actually find someone else who is interested, like has similar interest in SVG. That's correct. That's my, my good old friend, Rob Boys. Um, he is also uh, interested in SVG and uh, from a different context. So he was writing an import filter for SVGs for um, a vector drawing program called Carbon, used to be K-Illustrator back then. Um, so I was working on this import filter for Kaivio and we got together on IRC and talked about it and thought maybe we should join forces and write one common library that we could reuse within the KDE project for all the programs that want to import and render SVGs. So we got together and created a, a library called libksvg, which was renamed, I think, a few days later to ksvg and, and that's how it all started. Okay, so you're about i think 14 and rob is in in his 20s uh you're now both working on this kind of part-time you're geographically distributed uh which is possible because of the internet 
and you start merging your code bases, parsing SVG, stuff like that. Um, how long does it take you to extract the common like stuff so that your existing filters and stuff can work? I think it was maybe a few weeks. I cannot, honestly, I cannot remember it. It's almost two decades ago, uh, the actual time frame. Um, but I think it was a, a few weeks only. And then we had a, a common base for our Kyvio and, and Carbon import filters. So then you have this uh, like common library. Like, what, what's the idea? Like, what, what can you do now that you have this common library? Well, um, Actually, we wanted to um, use SVG not only in KOffice, but also in this um, browser called Conqueror back then. Um, so we re researched a bit how could we um, use this libk SVG or, or KSVG to render SVGs in uh, the Conqueror browser. And um, after a while, we found out that there was a, a, a software framework called KParts, um, which you could use to write a so-called component and embed it into other KDE projects. So um, by simply asking for a, a plugin that can render the image SVG plus XML MIME type, you could embed the library into, uh, into a running um, a program and use it to, to display content. So simply give it a URL. Here is my SVG and please render it in this kind of canvas. And this, um, we, we both thought this was interesting. So we, um, um, well, we got together and, and implemented this. Okay, so you, you and Rob, uh, like inevitably wind up putting SVGs in the browser for basically the first time, right? I mean, that was, that was pretty novel at the time. Right, but uh, I think we didn't really notice at, at this time how significant this is. We the only thing which was really convenient for us was a uh, um, to to regard Conqueror as as a quick testing shell for our SVG work, so that we can easily open SVGs, zoom and pan them, and and simply have a look at them. That that's so interesting that like uh, so many things uh, wind up being like so much more widely useful than you originally right than you originally imagined them. Um, so I think. Uh, at this time, these were basically like whole documents, right? Like you, you could open the whole SVG with a URL. That's what you could do. And you, I mean, giving them a URL is also just a super interesting idea of being able to open them in your browser. Um, but I don't think you, you couldn't embed them, right? Right. You, well, you could embed them in, in theory in, in an object using an HTML object tag since um, the, uh, the browser would simply sniff the MIME type from the target URL and then within this KPaaS framework ask for a handler for this kind of MIME type. But there was no integration between the host document and the, um, the embedded document. That is not possible technically. The web is actually in a very weird time here because W3C had sort of decided that HTML, as we think about it, was like done. Um, that was right. sort of like a good first pancake. Um, but it probably wasn't suitable to the needs of all of these other things that we imagined. And so SVG kind of came from that world, right? And so did so did MathML. Um, right, exactly. So so we spent really the first um, one and a half and two years of, of KSVG in, in implementing this SVG one, uh, I think it was one one um, specification. Um, Standalone. So really, um, we, we implemented all the features that SVG needed, like gradients, patterns, clipping, masking, and, and stuff like this. Uh, also, um, JavaScripting um, was, a, was a big part, manipulating the DOM, CSS, and so on. But we quickly realized, I think in 2003, um, it was clear that we will never be able to support like compound documents, which is a really interesting thing, like being able to, to mix inline SVG into HTML documents using um, CSS style sheets in one place to um, really style the whole uh, compound document, um, shared event handling, etc. cetera. Um, it is clear that it's not possible with the kind of solution that we are working on. Then there's this really wild turn in web history about like almost exactly halfway 
between the creation and us recording this. The web 2.0 is sort of here and it's defined by developers, not by the W3C, right? Like there's this split within the W3C. There's this special workshop called that is like, what, what do we do with this? And there's a proposal that maybe we should do another HTML with like the web that we have. And so in 2004, there's this breakaway and the what working group is created. It's Apple and Mozilla and Opera. By 2006, um, the first spec arrives and it's of the HTML parser. <laughs> Like, uh, that is a story that I feel like doesn't get told enough. So we're halfway, uh, and the web basically doesn't have tests. Like the W3C has no certification mechanism. It has no, like, it's not the same as a lot of standards bodies. We get HTML5 and web platform tests as a thing. We get the HTML parser, and we decide that we're going to pull over a whole bunch of these interesting ideas that developed. And two... Two languages kind of come over in whole. Like, they're just like, we're, yeah, we're just going to put that right in. You can embed them. And they're in the HTML specification, uh, SVG and MathML. Right. I know that back in, in, in 2004, I was really in the in the XML camp, like, like many of the people. So for me, the future was XHTML, XQuery, XForms, and stuff like this, all the uh, XML-derived dialects. Um, and until this point, I haven't even been thinking about um, um, uh, the semantic web HTML5. And, and um, for me, um, the main concern was uh, really prototyping what is possible. Like, how can we embed SVG in HTML? And it seemed really simple to me in the beginning before I tried to implement it. Um, and then after a while working on this, um, both Rob and me realized um, that the whole situation is completely underspecified. So there is no specification which tells us how to really integrate SVG or H uh, MathML in, into an HTML document. Like there are so many details to consider. CSS has this box model um, um, layout systems. SVG works completely different. How how do um, transformed SVG elements behave in HTML? Um, how does event handling, text selection, all the things you would expect um, to simply work, how do they actually work in detail? This was uncharted territory. Um, so when we tested all these things, um, we simply um, opted for a solution. We simply tried something and, and see how, how far we, we come with this solution. Um, but this tight integration between SVG and CSS and HTML is really difficult if you have uh, many, many degrees of freedom and no specification guiding you how to do it properly. There's this weird evolutionary thing where the thing that we have is probably not the thing that an engineer would sit down and be like, this is the good design. Like, this is the one that's going to make it, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> like, that, that's strange in retrospect, right? Like, it's it's weird how the technically best things frequently don't win. Right. I mean, I, I didn't really think about uh, the HTML parser so much back then, since SVG was a really a relatively new language. It had a um, XML-derived dialect, so um, how to, to parse a SVG document was really straightforward. Um, and there was no really content in the wild, like... Um, when you build an HTML engine, you have to deal with a lot of quirks, um, a lot of existing um, documents, which you um, simply have to deal with. Um, so there's lo lots of legacy and history. And SVG didn't have any of that. So th that's why I, I was not so con concerned about all these things, simply um, because SVG was a new language. I think everybody in the world was like on board the XML train initially. It's really interesting to see in retrospect how much that turned for practical reasons uh, that were those things that were like strangely hard to appreciate somehow. The, like the next few years, what, what happens? So when I when I um, joined university in 2005, I began to study physics. 
um, not computer science as many people think, um, simply because this is a, a personal passion of me and I was always interested in, in uh, especially in, in particle physics. Um, besides this, I, I kept working on the open source stuff, um, uh, working and contributing to KSVG, which was um, in 2006 merged into WebKit. Um, and that's how I uh, uh, joined the WebKit project, simply because there was a, a person called Eric Seidel um, who recognized the importance of, of KSVG. And he, um, he um, worked for Apple back then and imported all of the uh, libraries we invented within the KDE project. So this was KDOM, KSVG2, KHTML2, and KCanvas into WebKit. Um, because WebKit was missing uh, uh, SVG implementation and um, we uh, simply filled the gap with our implementation. And of course, for Rob and me, it was exciting since there were so many people uh, in the WebKit project and we were used to, to work uh, on our own and uh, the pace of um, progress within WebKit was uh, tremendous. So we uh, simply thought, okay, that's a perfect time to, to join this project and, and work on our SVG stuff there. Um, it has a promising future. We want to participate in this. So um, this went on for maybe five years when I was working, um, uh, or maybe four years when I was working uh, in my spare time on all of this. And um, at some point, I joined a company called Torch Mobile, also founded by uh, um, a friend of mine uh, who was in the KDE project, George Stakos. And I was working there um, also upstream on SVG and, and some internal um, uh, porting of WebKit to some embedded devices. So Torch Mobile sold this Iris browser. And I think in 2009... Yeah, I think it was 2009, uh, Touch Mobile was acquired by uh, Research in Motion, so the makers of the BlackBerry phone. And um, yeah, since then I used to work for BlackBerry, also upstream on SVG. Um, and I think this continued until 2012 when I um, uh, really had to graduate. So I, I needed to concentrate on, on my studies and, and stop contributing um, to WebKit for a while. And then very recently, you graduated with right, your doctorate, exactly. right? Really recently. <laughs> Congratulations. And then, but also very recently, then you came back and you came to work at right. Egalia, where Rob Baus also works. And we have like the original team KSVG right, here at right. Egalia, right? Uh, and also, interestingly, uh, just like you work for torch and you were working on this idea of embedding webkit the project that you're working on is embedded WebKit. <laughs> because here at agalia we work on wpe which is the official webkit port for embedded uh if you go to webkit.org downloads it's right there maybe you can explain to people why would you want to embed a web browser? Well, um, people wouldn't believe uh, in how many devices that they have at home is actually um, a WebKit browser running on it. Um, there are many, many billion of devices out there which run WebKit. So there are, for instance, all the PlayStation uh, consoles. There are uh, many, many set-top boxes, phones, um, some smart home systems, uh, cooking stations in your kitchen, um, many of them, which all um, which all show some kind of user interface, are nowadays using actually a web browser, since it's much more convenient for the companies that design these hardware products to um, to use a standard web browser for the user interface and have many um, uh, creative designers at hand which can build their user interfaces. So you don't need um, like uh, special developers that know a certain commercial product which uh, was uh, used in the past for building user interfaces. No, you simply use the web. For me, at least, this was a little bit funny because we have WebKit that most people think about as like Apple Safari. Um, and for most people, when you think about a browser, you think about like the button for the internet. But we know that there are like rendering engines and, and projects that are like embedded in like for Electron, for example, to make distributable applications that also use the same rendering engine. So 
help explain like what is the important thing to take away about like WPE? So WPE is one of the WebKit ports specifically optimized for embedded devices. So um, what is a WebKit port? It's actually um, WebKit itself is, is a layered project. It consists of several components. One of them is WebCore which implements the actual um, browser engine. So it's responsible for parsing and interpreting CSS, building the DOM tree, etc. cetera. And um, uh, in order to, let's say, paint something on, the, uh, on your device or react to uh, input events such as keyboard, touch events, etc., cetera, um, you need to call out to the actual operating system or the underlying windowing system. And each of the ports in WebKit um, is tied to a certain architecture. For instance, the WebKit GTK port uses the GTK toolkit on Linux desktop environments um, to draw or to handle the drawing and uh, the event handling. There are other ports such as uh, the macOS port, which uses the macOS APIs to achieve the same goal. But for an embedded device, this might not be a suitable solution since you do not want to be tied to a certain UI toolkit or a certain mechanism for painting, event handling, etc. So WPE is basically the bare minimum of a WebKit port, which is highly customizable so that you can uh, adapt WebKit to your custom needs. I think that's really awesome. And it's just growing and growing. Our WebKit port has been around for a long time. It's in really a lot of those devices. We are kind of close partners on WebKit. And uh, like last year, we were the number two contributor to WebKit, I think 11% of all the commits in WebKit were yeah, from Egalians, which is kind of awesome. Really interesting in this part of how we met, you, you had this idea and this sort of uh, legacy thing that you, you sort of left sitting there when you went away in college that feels like a, a, a gap uh, in web standards in browser implementations. Maybe you, you wrote a post on this. Can you maybe... Yes, I think the bottom line is uh, that we have to finally unify these co-evolutionary co branches of HTML and SVG. What I mean with this is um, when SVG was started, it, it had uh, transformations uh, from the beginning so that you can uh, apply any kind of a fine transformation to an element, rotate it, skew it, scale it, and so on. And all these features came also to HTML and CSS, but much later. CSS transforms were born much later. So much by much later, I mean long after SVG was published and implemented in the browsers, especially in WebKit. So in WebKit, there was always uh, some, some a special rendering path for SVG, which had all these fancy uh, stuff like transforms and uh, clipping, masking, stuff which was not available in HTML, at, at least not to the same extent as in SVG. But then um, HTML, CSS, and all these specifications, they caught up. CSS got all these features, CSS transformations, masking, composition, 3D transforms. And the implementation within WebKit is completely separated for, for SVG and HTML, CSS. And this is a bad thing because it leads to interoperability issues. Many of, the, um, many of these issues were solved within SVG2, like mapping um, certain... SVG special uh, attributes like the transform attribute uh, to a CSS property, which was finally specified how you actually do this, which, which takes precedence if you specify both an, a property, a CSS property and uh, the corresponding attribute. It's all now specified. And uh, while I was absent, so when I returned, I was really happy to, to find out that all these uh, specification issues, but not all, but many of them are solved. And now it's the right time to unify these rendering engines. Finally. CSS is sort of the in the core triad that people think about when they think about the web. And as a result, CSS got all these boosts and all these investments. So one of the boosts that it got exactly. was hardware acceleration. SVG2 by mapping those things provides a path toward hardware acceleration of SVGs. Right. In WebKit-based uh, browsers, the um, say, as example, uh, when you apply um, a transformation on a, a diff element and, and rotate it on, a, in, on, on the screen, in WebKit, you can offload all of these to the GPU so that the um, composition of the different graphics layers happens 
only on the GPU. So there's no uh, need for the CPU to be involved in this. So performance when, when offloading all of these composition work to the GPU is much higher. So you get fluent animations and a good user experience. For SVG, none of this is currently hardware accelerated, which leads to severe degradations when applying animations and you don't really get a fluent response, which people expect nowadays. So the, the clear path forward for WebKit is to move SVG to the same to the same rendering quality that HTML and CSS already offers. But one thing that I think is worth maybe being clear about is that the lack of ability to hardware accelerate things isn't exclusive to WebKit. Right. I mean, Chromium has the same legacy, so it has the, the same origin. Um, so Blink is uh, has imported or has, has forked the WebKit engine. And um, to my knowledge, the SVG implementation basically works the same as, as for um, WebKit still. So it's not hardware accelerated. The, the Blink guys, they have a, a clear plan uh, towards hardware acceleration as well. But currently, it's, it's still a plan, so it's not, uh, it's not available yet. Because this is actually even more important on embedded devices, right? Right. Uh, on embedded devices, um, the, uh, currently, many of the embedded devices, they have, um, uh, well, uh, let's say, underpowered CPUs, but they have a GPU. So when you want to build user interfaces that, that are really nicely looking on, on let's say, your, your cooking machine or your setup box on your TV, um, you want to use SVG. But at the moment, if you would do this, uh, it's slow. The animations, when you make a nicely animated user interface, it looks nice on your desktop machine. But when you run it on embedded devices, it, it looks um, well stuttering. The animation is not fluent. And it's not something you want to sell to customers. It's a little bit central to Agalia's whole ethos in a way, which is that what we're talking about here is sort of the commons. And how we build out the commons has all kinds of implications, a rising tide lifts all boats sort of thing, right? Right. And most, and I think most importantly, we can resolve much of the frustration that currently web authors are faced with since they expect things to um, to behave the same for SVG as for HTML and CSS, which is uh, simply not correct at the moment. And we have to unify and resolve all these issues. Uh, Sarah Drasner, um, she's been on for a long time about like, can we not just hardware accelerate these things, please? And for whatever reason, it has been really hard to prioritize the investment in these things, right? The first mover here is kind of driven and funded by a group that isn't Google or Apple or uh, sort of the traditional pressures that you think of. So I'm I'm really thankful for Igalia who um, um, who allowed me to prototype all this um, unification um, stuff in in WebKit since it is involving a lot of research since the implementation is so divergent internally. Uh, it's really two completely different implementations, how SVG works and how the rest works. Uh, this was like this from the beginning, uh, but from a different perspective. So in the beginning, HTML was lacking all these fancy stuff that SVG needs. And now it's it's basically the other way around. S uh, HTML and CSS offers way more, like 3D transformations, uh, stuff that SVG traditionally never supported. And now to, to really um, unify them, there, you basically need to rewrite the whole SVG rendering engine, which is a huge task. And it's not clear from the beginning how can this be split into small atomic chunks. Um, and it's also not clear how, how to actually um, integrate HTML and CSS and SVG internally in terms of the implementation. So it, it needs a lot of research. How, how to deal with all these uh, different requirements that H SVG still has. But finally, I think we are on a, on a good way in 2020 to have an initial patch for this, um, for discussion. And I'm thankful that Igalia uh, allowed me to work on this. And uh, We can include in the sort of show notes the, uh, a link to your animated Tiger demo, which is really cool. And I think really okay. exciting and has been shared around a bunch since you wrote your your article. We have had sort of, you know, feedback from a lot of different venues that this is really interesting and really exciting for a lot of people. Our work, because it is being funded by Embedded, then also 
everybody gets that advantage, right? Like it's not just embedded WebKit that's going to get that. It's all users are going to get that. Exactly. Um, uh, then that also uh, plays into this kind of like first mover pressure that exists in web standards and browsers where like once WebKit has a competitive advantage because we can hardware accelerate, that sort of like lights a little fire under other people to do it as well. And this is only like one uh, illustration. It's a nice one because like it, it's a big deal and it's sort of uh, very tied to WebKit and things that we're talking about. But there are other things where these pressures are similar as well. And when we have different people participating at the implementation prioritization level that we at Egalia enables, um, that can be really healthy for the ecosystem. That's correct. Fully agreed. Okay, I think this was like really, really interesting, full of like interesting history about the web and WebKit. It was really exciting, the stuff that I, I think you're talking about doing with SVG. I learned a lot actually about uh, SVG history as well myself. Are there any other closing thoughts that you wanted to leave us with? Well, I would just say stay tuned for 2020. Hopefully this will be the year of uh, hardware ac accelerated SVG. And um, well, I will do my best to uh, to get this into WebKit and uh, open a discussion how to get it into other brands. Awesome. Thanks. Brian. Th thanks. Thanks a lot for sitting and talking with me. Thank you. Bye-bye. For having me. Bye-bye. <laughs>